This is Diane DeRigo. I'm Radioactive Waste Project Director at Nuclear Information and Resource Service. I'm originally from Western New York and have been tracking the West Valley Nuclear Waste Site since the late 1970s. At the site are a former reprocessing facility, burial grounds, and buildings to accompany those activities. The buildings include the, the biggest one, which is slated to be demolished in 2020 to 2021, is the reprocessing building. And it was also used to solidify the high level liquid from reprocessing uh, decades later. There are 57 high level waste casks holding the solidified waste. There are underground tanks caked with high level radioactive sludge there is a commercial burial ground that brought in nuclear waste from 63 to 1972, 14 trenches, 30 to 40 feet deep, and at least 14 pounds of plutonium. There are high level waste burial holes that are in a burial ground adjacent to the commercial burial ground. And there are migrations of radioactivity from the site, a cesium prong that was the result of filter blowout during reprocessing, which was from 66 to 72. Strontium plume, which is also from a spill in the late 1960s inside the building and is now migrating underground towards streams and into the groundwater. And there's a wall that was built into the ground to filter some of the radioactivity out before it gets uh, into the public. There is a building with long lasting waste called transuranic or greater than class C like, and that is um, waste that is very long lasting and especially dangerous if inhaled or ingested. And there is a construction and demolition landfill. Some of the radioactive elements that are on the site are plutonium, which is dangerous for a quarter to a half a million years and heads for the lungs once it gets in the body, although it does go to other places. Iodine-129 has a 16 million year half-life. So you multiply the half-life by 10 or 20 to get the hazardous life. So for that iodine isotope, it's dangerous for 160 to 320 million years and it goes to the thyroid when it gets into our bodies. Strontium and cesium are generally dangerous for 300 to 600 years, and strontium goes to bones, causing bone cancer and leukemia. Cesium is a heart seeker, uh, I'm sorry, a muscle seeker, and the heart is a muscle, so it is related to heart ailments. There's radioactive water, tritium, there are long-lasting uranium, cobalt, very intense gamma emitter, and hundreds of other radioactive isotopes. The site itself is cut by streams, and then those drain into creeks next to the site that run up into the Buttermill Creek and the Cattaraugus and uh, Lake Erie. The streams are eroding toward the site as well as running through the site and constant maintenance is required to make sure that they don't, that the, the burial areas are not encroached on. When the creeks flow from the site, they go into the buttermilk and the buttermilk creek flows up to the northwest. The whole site boundary includes the Buttermilk Creek up until it joins the Cattaraugus so that, especially during the dirty reprocessing in 1966 to 72, when the water was very hot, radioactively hot, um, it would meet the release levels, but it needed to get diluted by streams and creeks running into it and adding to the volume. It's not a safe level, but a legal level. The flow here of the water in general is from the site. On the lower right, there's a small yellow-orange um, radiation area. That's where the West Valley site is. The Buttermilk Creek goes from there across to Cataraugus, 
which flows through Gowanda and the Zor Valley, a magnificent recreation area, boating, fishing, hiking, playing, swimming, a beloved area in western New York. And then it goes through the uh, Ketaragas territory of the Seneca Nation of Indians. And Native people do have more contact with waterways and with the fish and uh, than the average population. So it's especially dangerous to have radioactivity uh, going through a place where the creeks are so utilized. In this photo, it's the Cataraugus Creek flowing into Lake Erie and to the north above the creek there is the Seneca Nation, Cataraugus Territory. The water flows around into the lake and is taken up by the water intakes for Erie County and Western New York, Buffalo Erie County water intake, which also serves the Cataraugus Nation, or the Seneca Nation. It flows to the Buffalo waterfront, newly revitalized, and beyond that, Lake Erie to the Niagara River. Niagara Falls, and then Niagara Falls, or the Niagara River, enters Lake Ontario. And you can see here with this view from the space that it doesn't dilute fully in the whole volume of the lake, but it hugs the shore. And radioactivity was found in Lake Ontario that was from West Valley. So what happened there? From 66 to 72, reprocessing took place. This is the building where the reprocessing and later solidification happened. The irradiated fuel from the core of nuclear power plants, nuclear weapons plants, was brought to West Valley. In these rods that make up the assembly, uh, you'll see, uh, well, you don't see it, but you can know that it's uranium and the fission products that resulted from making electricity and plutonium that formed from neutron absorption. So there are, the rods are encrusted with intense amounts of radioactivity. They would give a lethal dose unshielded in just a few minutes. So what they did at West Valley was to disassemble, chop up the assemblies, the rods, and dissolve them in acids and bases and chemicals to extract then the uranium and plutonium that was left, leaving all of the other radioactive elements in a uh, liquid that went into large tanks on the site. This is the pool, the water-filled pool that the irradiated fuel was placed in when it came to the site and before it got reprocessed. After it got reprocessed, the liquid and sludge went into these very large underground tanks that were not gonna last as long as the radioactivity in them. So, and there was also a worry that they might start to leak sooner rather than later. So in 1980, Congress passed a law to have the Department of Energy come in and clean them up. During the reprocessing years, the workers at West Valley got the highest doses of any nuclear workers in the country. The doses were at and above the maximum levels, and those maximum levels are, are now higher in the US than they are in the rest of the world. As I said, the tanks were underground, so this is an, uh, an above-ground view after they were uh, filled and closed. And in 1980, realizing that there was a danger of the radioactive uh, liquids leaking out into the area and then into the waterways, after much pressure from activists in New York, from local, state, and federal officials from New York, the federal government passed the West Valley Demonstration Project Act, bringing the Department of Energy in to Western New York, to West Valley, to clean up the reprocessing portion of the site that had been um, 
messed up by nuclear fuel services. The state of New York owns the site and is responsible for the rest of the site um, in a, 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 outside of the reprocessing portion. So when the law passed, the first thing they wanted to do was turn that liquid in the underground tanks into a solid. And that was done successfully. It took about a decade, a little more, to get that liquid out, convert it into glass logs, which were then uh, stored in the building, which is very well shielded. But a radioactive leak was detected coming from the building. So they wanted to take down the building to get at that leak and prevent further um, movement of the radioactivity. So they had to, the Department of Energy then, um, put the high level logs into concrete canisters. There are five canisters that go into casks. So the concrete casks at the site, uh, number 57, 55 of them each have five glass logs, and then two of them have other debris. The plume of radioactivity under the ground from a spill in the late 1960s um, has been spreading, and a permeable treatment wall was built dug in the ground and filled to filter out some of the strontium and other radioactive elements before they get into the drinking water. And it's um, not filtering all of it out, and it is intended to last for about 20 years, and then the wall itself will be waste. And that plume is moving toward the creeks uh, offsite. Uh, it has gotten to groundwater and it, some of the radioactivity is getting off the site, but less than if that permeable wall wasn't there. So here's an overview of the West Valley site. As you can see, those buildings on the right and then the burial areas on the left are on plateaus, which are surrounded by creeks that are eroding toward them. So the goal is to get this stuff out of there before the creeks uh, get into and release the radioactive materials that are that are stored at the site, buried and then in buildings. So a lot of the buildings have been removed, but the main plant process building has yet to be demolished. It's expected to come down in 2020 to 2021. But the point here is that the entire area is on rapidly eroding plateaus and climate change makes this worse. In 2008, Mike Wilson, the head of the ge geology uh, program at the State University of New York at Fredonia, predicted that these creeks would move in toward the burial areas. And in fact, in 2009, a year later, there was a very large storm and in one storm event the buttermilk creek moved 15 to 20 feet closer to the west valley nuclear waste site and the trenches that have radioactive waste buried in them this is a view of the landslide from buttermilk so this is what it's moving toward radioactive waste that was buried between 63 and 1975 in the 14 trenches, there are at least 14 pounds of plutonium, and the waste is buried in boxes and barrels and even cardboard boxes in some cases. So it's pretty likely that many of those containers are not intact uh, many decades later. This is another view of uh, that burial area as it was being um, excavated and the barrels put in. In 1975, water filled up in those trenches through the trench caps and the commercial nuclear operations were halted because uh, of the, the problem. A new cap was put over the trenches to keep water from getting in, but there's also a worry that water will continue to get in through the sides and 
leak down below into the sole source aquifer and leak through the sides into the streams and creeks that run toward Lake Erie and the population. There's quite a bit of radioactivity uh, in the tens to hundreds of um, thousand curies. Curies are a measure of radioactivity. Uh, they're a, um, an amount of radioactivity and uh, even a billionth of a curie can uh, initiate cancers. That was the trench cap that had been placed on the uh, 14 trenches to keep water from getting in. So what do we need? We need, and what the West Valley Action Network has been calling for, is full cleanup of the site, real-time air monitoring and water monitoring with public reporting, a cover over the building during the demolition to prevent nuclear materials from dispersing into the air, and off-site monitoring. We want greater transparency on what the Department of Energy and the New York State Energy Research Development Authority are doing both physically at the site and with their contractors to lead to the final decision that is about to be made on how to leave the site, what the final end state will be. Will the waste be left there or will it be excavated and isolated? And one of the ways to keep track of that information, there's a massive amount of information and studies being done, would be an electronic searchable library online to provide for the public in real time, updated, all of the information, the reports, the assumptions that are being made, the computer codes and models that are uh, being used to predict the instability or the stability of the site in the future. There's a lot of guessing going on and the assumptions are sometimes secret. We are calling for sharing of that information to help us have a better ability to implement the final decision on the site through the environmental impact statement process and so that future generations can keep track of the site. In 2009, before the last environmental impact statement was carried out, the Seneca Nation of Indians passed a resolution calling for the full cleanup of the site. Uh, there was a study done that, uh, before that that indicated it would be cheaper and more protective to excavate the site now and isolate it than wait until even a very small portion of it leaks out into the waterways and into the drinking water supply and then try to remedy it later. After they passed this resolution, every local government, towns, cities, counties, and many, many organizations, dozens of Canadian, U.S. Uh, organizations passed similar resolutions calling for full cleanup. And the state delegation to the State Assembly and Senate and the U.S. congressional delegation also weighed in in favor of full cleanup. Unfortunately, the Department of Energy and NYSERDA decided on phased decision making in 2010. And now in 2020, we're looking at what will be the second and final stage and how clean that site will be left. Will it be left as it is, all of the waste left there, or will it be uh, cleaned up all or partially? The timeline that the Department of Energy and the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority have is a supplemental environmental impact statement started back in 2017 and expected to be completed by 2022, might spill into 23, with public comment periods, a period in 2021. And for the public to have meaningful opportunity to give input, uh, we are calling for all of the data and information the probabilistic performance assessment assumptions, the expert studies that have been done to put all of that information into a searchable electronic database or library. And for full disclosure, uh, what's going on on the site and what's being planned. If you're concerned and interested 
There are dozens of groups that are part of the West Valley Action Network. A few of them would be glad to work with you. Nuclear Information Resource Service, my group, Coalition on West Valley Nuclear Waste, the original group that started in the 70s tracking the site, the Sierra Club, the Indigenous Women's Initiatives, and the Citizens Environmental Coalition. Thanks so much for your interest. And we hope that you'll join in and make your voices 